chapter 4 the forest society and colonialism in this chapter we will be dealing with what is a forest how did the society start to impact on the forest how the forest got degraded or forest started to disappear due to the influence of colonialism these all aspects we will be dealing in this unit you all might be studying in a school where you find benches made of wood and everything you find there is something which we get from forest in your school even when you write with a pencil that also is made with the wood of the forest trees only so these all in every day to day life we find things which connect us with the forest we don't know directly that they are from the forest so in this unit we will be discussing what are the reasons that made the people to do deforestation and what is deforestation let us see now if you look at the Amazon forest or the Western Ghats forests, they are in one pitch, a long stretch forest where you find 500 different varieties of plants and species which are living here. And UN has recognized these as the World Heritage Sites list recently. And now from 1700 to 1995, the people started to cut down the trees that is 13.9 million square kilometers of the forests are being cleared for various reasons like industrialization or for any other constructions or whatever it is. It is nearly 9.3% of the entire forest cover what we have on the earth. So why did the people do deforestation? Now, why did the man started to do deforestation? Coming to India's background. India is a land where one-sixth of its population truly depends on agriculture. Today, we have three-fourths of the population depending on agriculture. So, the number of people depending on agriculture started to grow the year by year after. So, deforestation means the clearing of the forest for whatever may be the reason. So, the forest gets disappeared. The naturally grown trees, which are homes for the animals to survive, were known as forests. But today, they are clearing the forest and this results in shooting out of the forest from the land. So you get extra land. As the years passed on, the India's population started to grow up year after year. The population is growing. The need for the food to supply food for all the population so the demand for the food started to increase in order to match up the requirement of the food requirement the situations turned in such a way that the Britishers itself directly encouraged to clearing up of the forest Britishers first thought the clearing of the forest would help the people to do commercial cropping commercial cropping whatever we do the cultivation for the earning huge amounts of profit is known as commercial cropping. This commercial cropping major crops are jute, sugar, cotton, wheat, etc. So they started to do these crops. These are first initially encouraged by the Britishers. So to match up the food requirements of the population growth also, they slowly started to give permissions to clear the forest. They also thought that forests are waste and they are not at all used. If we clear the forest and bring them under the agricultural use, they can collect tax from them. It automatically generates revenue for the Britishers. So in this process, they started to give permission for the people to cut the forest. Britishers standing at the first encourage the people to clear the forest. Now the population who are depending on agriculture started to grow day by day. The need for the food also increased, the demand for the food also increased day by day up. So in order to balance these both, the clearing of the forest has become mandatory. We all have to remember the fundamental that even to plow the soil or till the land, we need the forest to be cleared. Along with that, it was a time when the industries are shooting up at here and there. So to match or to supply the raw materials for the industries, we need the raw materials from the forest to the industry. So for that purpose also, they started to clear the forest to get the raw materials for the industries. And the growth of urbanization, people started to migrate from villages to cities. 
in order to match up the requirement of the urbanization also people started to move from one region to another region so for this all reasons they started to clear the lands the forests which are nearby to the cities were been cleared completely to accommodate them to supply food for them to do cultivation for them to supply raw materials for the industries so there are various reasons which encourage the deforestation now the sleepers the arrival of the railway track network in india also paved way for the massive destruction of the forests the oak forests in england were started to get disappear because they were used in a large number to build the ships which used to be necessary to carry the loads from india to the other countries and also to maintain the royal navy ships it has become a very difficult for them to supply timber for the royal navy so to find a substitute for this the britishers have sent search teams in 1820s to find out in india because india has large amount of forest in existence so find out whether the timber is available there or not yes the search teams arrived to india found that in india we have huge amount of timber available so immediately the orders were given to cut down the timber trees and export the timber from india to england so that's how the royal navy's necessities were been started to be fulfilled and in india the deforestation started officially as the time passed on now the demand or the necessity to have a well connected transport system from the interland to the outer parts so we have ships there is supply of this timber for the ships within the inner lands or the hinterland regions to the port areas we need to have a good connectivity so they started to lay the railway tracks in the process of laying the railway tracks we need a track known as sleepers between the tracks to hold both the tracks together so the sleepers we need for every mile we need 1700 to 2000 sleepers which connect both the tracks together so for this we need again timber trees so in order to lay the tracks we need the sleepers first so for having sleepers they started to cut down the trees again in large number so by 1850s the need for the railway network fuel and the line holders sleepers are required for this all the basic source is the timber trees so in 1890 25500 kilometers of railway track is laid and it went on up to 1946 it is 765000 kilometers of railway track lines has been laid down which shows how much amount of trees are cut only in 1850 in madras presidency nearly 35000 timber trees were cut so the huge downfall of the timber trees started to because of the britishers one because of to supplement the oak forests which are getting disappeared in england to so substitute that search teams were sent to india to find out they came to india they have done the research and from here timber started to be exported to other country especially england to match the requirements of royal navy ships and later they started to build the railway network in india so in order to connect their both the railway tracks they need the railway line help sleepers which are made of timber and nearly 1760 to 2000 for every mile so all these facilitated for the disappearance of the forest plantations a large piece of land will be cleared to grow a special or a particular crop on a very large scale that is known as plantations in this process of making plantations the british government the colonial british government encouraged to destroy the forest and give that vast land for the european planters at very less cost in order to meet the requirements of the european continent as there is a growing need and demand for tea coffee and rubber they gave orders to clear the entire forest which is in a very vast stretch expanded in india so they gave orders to clear that one and that land is given to the european traders at a very very considerable cost so that they can cultivate the crop and from here they can export it to their country and from there they can earn huge profits so this idea of plantations also paved the way for clearing the forest and helping hand for 
deforestation. Now, the rise of commercial forestry. The British need forests in India. British started to get worried with the disappearance of the forest in our country. If you recover back or if you look at the back on the initial days of the lesson, that is in the first part of the lesson, Britishers were the first people to encourage deforestation. But when we look at the reasons, why did the Britishers encourage them to do deforestation? They are finding the disappearance of oak forests in England. So in order to compensate the balance of that disappearance, they have sent the search teams to come to India and find out the trees which can replace and match up the requirements of what they require. Their teams have arrived to India, found that timber is the best suitable fund for them and they gave the reports and timber has been started to be cut from India and that is being sent to England to match up the requirements of the Royal Navy to build the ships and later for railway sleepers. Now, as the days pass on, the cutting down of the trees is not only official, but it is given to the private contractors at very less cost. So, the local people also started to cut down the trees in order to have their own uh, charcoal wood or they want to clear the forest or they want to do the agriculture or whatever may be the reason. So, this felling down of the trees at a very high rate started to worry the Britishers. So, to find out a solution for this, they have invited an expert from Germany known as Dietrich Brandis. He was an expert and he was asked to come to India and to give some solution or some suggestion to safeguard the forests of the country. So, he was the first inspector general of forests in our country in India and he came and said that we need a system in place, we need a set of rules that have to guide how the forest should be there, how the cutting down of the trees should happen. Everybody could not cut the trees, only the authorized people only can cut the trees and if anyone violates these rules, they are eligible for punishments. They have to give in severe punishments so that the others do not indulge in violation of the rules. So, he also gave an idea to set up Indian Forest Services in 1864 and he started a Indian Forest Services Act in 1865. He also established a research institute at Dehradun in 1906 to study about the Indian forest system. He also gave a new concept of scientific forestry. What is the scientific forestry? What was his intention in giving this idea or developing the concept of scientific forestry? Scientific forestry is a systematic way of dealing with forest. That's what the expert has given the idea. He has set up a research institute where the officials studied the different ideas. So now moving on to understand scientific forestry means in general for us in forest we find different varieties of trees. So he told that first cut down all the different varieties of trees and replace them with a single type of tree. Clear all the trees which are different. We want a single crop like for example timber trees. We want timber crop. So cut down all the other trees which are present in the forest and clear the land and plant the timber trees in a straight row and have a plan of execution of that. So, yes, we are cutting down the forest, but we are rebuilding or replanting the trees to balance that ecologically and this timber forest in a single crop and a single straight lines rows will give us commercial benefit also. This pattern of planting a single tree or a single crop in straight lines for commercial purpose is known as plantations. So, the plantations are first the products of the scientific forestry. For this always the officials used to plan and they used to decide how much amount of the forest has to be cut and how much has to be replant every year. According to their rules and regulations only the cutting down of the forest 
and replanting of the forest happens and he also passed certain forest acts in 1865 these acts are modified again in 1878 and 1927 according to these acts in 1878 he divided the forests into three major categories first one the reserved forest second one the protected forest third one the village forest the first uh, act what we discussed about is in 1878 the reserved forest is nothing but the best forest what we have come under the category of the reserved forest the second one the protected and the third is the village in the reserved forest the villagers are not allowed to cut any kind of trees if they need anything for their household or fuel or any other purpose they can cut from protected and the village forest but they are not allowed to enter into the reserved forest because reserved forests are the best forest which are available in our country at that time according to the act of 1878 so the scientific forestry is nothing but clear the forest where the different varieties of trees are there clear all the trees and plant a single variety of plantations so that you can plant them in a straight line grow them and you can earn huge profits from them this in a large land planting a particular variety of tree and growing it is known as plantations for this also he has set up a systematic procedure the officials used to survey the land study the land and they used to decide how much percentage has to be cut and how much has to be replanted so that the balance happens continuously and always without any disturbance ecologically as well as for the requirement of the timber for England and he categorized the forest into three major categories that is the protected reserved and as well as the village forests. so preserved is something the best forest which are available at that point of time so this cannot be touched or reached by any people and no one is allowed to enter inside the villagers or the local people to cut the fuel or for their household needs or anything the protected and village forests are allowed for the people to use for their own requirements now how were the lives of the people affected with the scientific forestry which was implemented by the Britishers till that time the forests are filled with varieties of plants this brought a split between the villagers and the foresters villagers want many types of trees to grow together so that many requirements would be matched many requirements would be fulfilled from the forest when it comes to the foresters they want only a single type of variety of crop which will like sal or teak or timber which grow very tall and which can be done in straight rows which can be collected and they can do the railways or shipbuilding or whatever it is they are just looking at it in the commercial lines whereas moving on to the villagers they want everything because they are habituated of using the forest for everything like for building houses they used to cut the wood they used to take their animals for grazing they used to take the fruits tuber for medicine and medicines leaves everything they used to use in everything like even the leaves which are shedded out from the trees were all collected and they were attached to each other and used as disposables for eating and water collection so for everything for medicinal plants and everything they should depend on the forest this was a view of the villagers but it is completely contrary to the view of the foresters so this brought hardships for the villages the enabling acts made the villagers away from forest the villagers used to go for housing cut the wood grazing take their animals collection of fruits and food from the forest as per their requirements but because of the rules now these people are not allowed into the forests so now these people have to steal whatever they want housing they have to rob the trees or cut the trees secretly and grazing they could not take them freely collection of fruits and all leaves and all has become very difficult and that made them to become robbers 
and when these people are caught by any of the constables or anybody it is at their mercy that how they would used to treat the people they used to harass the people and women who used to go for collecting the fuel wood and all they are very much worried about this incidents and this developments and later they used to harass the people those who go for cutting down the wood and all for food especially during that time so like this there was a differences of opinion between the people on the issue of forest how the forest should be how they want the forest to be they want a plan plantation model of forestry well these people want the forest which is a blend of different different varieties of trees which will meet the requirements and which will give as a house for medicines as a house for any requirement whatever you need you can get from the forest even fruits the natural wealth is available in forest which they want to destroy now how did these rules affect the cultivation system how the cultivation got affected because of the rules of scientific forestry till now we have discussed about how the people have different views when it comes to the growth of forest now moving on to the details of cultivation in india we have the shifting cultivation in practice shifting cultivation is known as ladding in southeast asia milpa in central america thavi in africa and channa in sri lanka like this it has different different names it is also known as sweden cultivation in sweden also we have different names according to the local names so it is called with different local names also so this shifting cultivation what is this shifting cultivation actually the shifting cultivation is nothing but a piece of land is been cultivated for a couple of years afterwards it is burnt and left out for a certain time period and then again they start doing the cultivation so this is also known as cut and burnt in rotation this is a main feature of shifting cultivation a piece of land is been cut the forest are been cut and they were burnt and in the ashes they sow the seeds after the first monsoons with the first monsoons coming over the seeds will go deeper into the soil and then they grow and they start to do the cultivation after 3 or 4 years they clear that one and they leave it empty for 12 to 18 years of time so with this gap again the forest will grow in that region so like this the cultivation is known as shifting cultivation this shifting cultivation has been looked weird by the britishers they thought if they are doing cultivation like this it will definitely affect the timber production and once the land is cleared and you are not able to do it for 12 to 18 years which is really a big blow for them where they cannot meet the requirements of their railway network or the royal navy shipping so they decided we should not encourage this kind of methods and they were also worried that when the burning of the shifting crop or whatever it is that is happening when they burn the crop the flames may raise up and they even burn the timber trees which is very harmful according to them so the crop will destroy the profits what they are getting so let us ban this system of shifting cultivation the british officials banned the system of shifting cultivation which forced many of the forest people those who are doing the shifting cultivation to leave the forest and move to some other places some of them have taken the different occupations while some revolted and resisted in small and large rebellions so this is the impact because it is connected with the day to day life of the people whatever kind of cultivation they are doing they are dependent on agriculture they clear a piece of land burn it sow the seeds do cultivation and leave that land migrate to another place but now this kind of system itself is banned so they don't know what to do next and they don't know any other type of cultivation also so they are forced to take some other occupations or some people who are very much well connected and now they are living their forests they are living their cultivation so the day to day activities are getting affected so that frustrated the people on a very large scale and many small and large rebellions took place after these laws were kept in place who could hunt actually 
hunting was been one of the activities of the forest dwellers the forest dwellers used to hunt deer partridges and small animals that was their regular activity like they used to go to collect the household food or they used to go for collecting the wood charcoal or they used to cut kill some animals like this deer or hunt them and get food for them but later the britishers after making these acts they restricted the activity of any of the forest dwellers in hunting the animals that was a severe crime and they will be caught under the act of poaching so the poaching is severely restricted by the britishers through the forest acts but the britishers also encouraged hunting they made hunting as a most sport game the sport of hunting tigers has become so extensively so widely accepted that the hunting went on on a very large scale by the british officials the kings the maharajas and everybody of that time and it resulted in the extinct and endangering of the species of the animals also here are the statistics for us the britishers used to believe that having wild animals is a burden and dangerous for society it shows the uncivilized attitude of the indians so they want to civilize the indians so they encourage the killing of the animals like 80000 tigers were killed 150000 leopards means 1.5 lakh leopards were killed and 2 lakh wolves were killed from the period of 1875 to 1925 maharaja of sarguja alone killed 1157 tigers and 2000 leopards till 1957 and a british official named george yule killed 400 tigers so the killing of the animals was looked very severely and they used to encourage the people to kill the animals by the british officials or the rich people or maharajas or anybody we have heard mughal princes or prince just having an attitude of going for sport of hunting and coming back but here they literally killed thousands of animals which later on the at the end only we have the environmentalists and the conservatives standing up and raising their voices saying that every animal has to be protected to maintain the balance in the society of forests so then only the voices start to be heard and now the situation is that we have very less number of tigers in existence now the campaigning of project tiger is all are initiated to protect the tigers this all are the results of what the britishers did from 1875 to 1925 new trades new employments and new services with the banning of the people's entry into the forest through the forest acts that paved way for the people to take over new opportunities so let us see how they are influencing the people the acts which were brought into place by restricting the entry of the people in 1878 act the reserved forest that allowed only few people to enter into the forest and which made the people to leave their traditional occupations and emerge as a new occupants or take over new op- jobs what are this for example it's not only the case in india we also have this in other countries also the brazilian amazon forest where we used to have the tribe called manduruku tribe these people used to cultivate manioc in the field of forest region by practicing this shifting agriculture later with the restrictions of forest acts they started to collect latex the from the wild rubber trees and they started to supply it for the traders slowly as the time passed on these people left out doing agriculture and started to settle down as the traders and live outside the forest initially they used to stay in the interior parts of the forest but later they moved on to outside parts of the forest and settled as traders so like this it's not new even in india to have trade with the forest products the adivasis and the banjaras used to trade like elephants hides horns or the ivory and even the silk cocoons bamboo gums 
resins, medicinal herbs, everything they used to dread earlier. As the times passed on, the restrictions have been placed. The certain tribes like Karor, Karorva, Karacha, Yerukula are considered as criminal tribes in the Madras presidency. So these people are being restricted entry into them. So it's not always compulsory that when we take up the new uh, jobs, it would be easy for them or like for example, because of the tea plantations or because of the factory productions or in the industrial areas, as they are forced to take up some or the other odd jobs. So when they enter into the tea plantations, the Britishers used to pay very less and they have to work very hard. In the regions like Assam and all, they used to take the tribal community people to work in the tea plantations and the treatment was horrible. They never used to allow them to leave the tea plantations also. So if they try to go, they used to be punished them very severely. So it's not always nice or good or it gives a positive trend like whenever you take a new turn and you join into new things or you started a new opportunity or new jobs that will definitely get you a positive result. It is sometimes it is yes, the Munduruku tribes have turned themselves into traders, but the Adivadis and the Banjaras could not turn up like that as per the expectations. So they have to work in the factories, they have to work in the industries, they have to work as daily wage laborers, they have to work in the tea plantations. These all went on to the other side where it brought large impact for them and pressure and worried for them. So this the actually these people are dependent on the forest they are denied the forest rights they are denied the entry into the forest they are now denied to do anything in the forest and now they are forced to work at very less wages and very harsh treatment is meted for them these are some of the reasons why the forest tribes started to rebel against the government so what are the major rebellion incidents that happen in our country we will see now rebellion in the forest there are many rebellion activity, rebellions which against the Britishers. One of some of the famous are why these rebellions have come? Because the existing system has been disturbed by the British laws. The Britishers have restricted the entry of the people into the forest. They are forcing them to leave their traditional occupations. These changes trigger the anger of the people against the Britishers. So some of them who fought are Siddhu and Kanu in the Santal region and Birsa Munda in the Chota Nagpur Plateau and also Allur Sitaram Raju in Andhra Pradesh state. So these all are even today remembered in some of the folk songs which are sung in these regions. Now we shall discuss one of the rebellion incident which took place in Bastar district. So where is this Bastar? Bastar is located in Chhattisgarh state. It is the name of a district located in the Chhattisgarh state. It has the boundaries like Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Jharkhand and Orissa. It also has different tribal people staying here. It has one of the tributaries of Godavari, Indravati flowing through this one and half part is a plateau. On the southern side we have the winds of the Indravati. So we have a plateau and we also have the fertile land here. We have the tribe of the people like uh, Maria, Muria Gons, Durvas, Batras and Halbas. These are the different tribal people who live in this district. And these people have different languages also. But they all have common customs and share common beliefs. So the Marias, Muria Gons, Durvas, Batras and Halbas have different different languages well they speak but they all have common customs and believe in common beliefs they used to respect every village as the earth given gift for them the land is nothing but the given gift by the god to them so every tribal people used to have their own villages and they used to respect their villages and they never used to cross the borders so they used to have the local heads to maintain everything and whenever they require anything which is available in the other village, they used to pay some small amount of fee for them, known as popularly Dand. And once in a year, they all used to meet at the Paragana or the cluster of the villages together. The headmen used to meet 
and discuss the issues about the villages and even about the forest what has to be done and what are the steps that are necessary to avoid any kind of conflicts which are there between the people so this is how the bastar districts background is this gives an idea about the people so here the people are the tribal people they have different language spoken people they have common culture common customs they respect their land very much they have a mutual concern between one village and the other villagers so all these are the existing system in bastar so what happened next now the fears of the people why did the people are getting scared with the moves of the british authorities two thirds of the forest in 1905 has been declared as a reserved forest so the entry into the forest has been completely restricted along with this they are stopping the shifting cultivation hunting of the animals and collection of the any kind of wood or food or anything so with this these people now became jobless and some of the villages are known as forest villages how did it get the forest villages names some of the villages are allowed to stay in the forest and in turn they have to help the government in cutting down the forest trees transportation of the trees and also save the forest from any kind of fires which are been light against the other parts for this uh, shifting cultivation so save the timber from the fires which are coming from outside so they help the government to cut the trees to cut the forest and to transport it from the interior regions to the outer parts but these all are allowed only for few people and the other uh, villagers are thrown out of the forest without paying any compensation and there is no compensation no alternative and most of the times there was no work but outside of the forest you have to pay high land rents there is no money for them to survive lack of money and during that period only officials always forced the villagers to work for no money they want them to work freely if anyone rejected they used to punish them and harass them this all happened in this resulted in the terrible famine in 1899 to 1900 and once again in 1907 to 1908 so what happened next the discussions about these restrictions which made the uh, topic of village council and in every bazaar in every festival every headman all started to discuss because of the reserved forest only because of the acts which are placed by the british only now we are facing lot of difficulties so we need to fight against the britishers so the durwas of kanger forest were the first to initiate the process of rebelling against the government one of the famous leader was gunda dur he belongs to the netanar village and he was also one of the famous names who fought in the bastar rebellion so in 1910 mango bogs lumps of earth and the red chilies were circulated around all the villages so what is the meaning of the circulation of red chilies mango bogs or the lumps of the earth they are spreading the message that yes this is the time to rebel against the government rebel against the britishers we cannot survive if you do like this if you rebel them and destroy them only we can find some solution for all our problems so like this the process got initiated and every village started to contribute something or the other for this rebellion moment then what happened now every village started to help somehow or the other for this rebellion moment the bazaars were looted the houses of the officials like the traders schools and the police stations everything was burnt and robbed what did they rob they robbed the grains which are available here and the grains are redistributed to the villagers all of them so the rebellion was targeted to burn the offices collect the grains and redistribute them and once it is done this all was observed by a missionary observer known as william ward william ward made it a statement that from all sides streaming came into the jagadalpur police station in this police station we have the school masters we have the forest peons and we also have the police people coming in and the police 
started to react for this one because they are burning the government officials buildings they are burning the government offices they are targeting the schools run by the britishers they are targeting the, the uh, police stations and they are burning them they are killing the officials so what has to be done next they started to suppress them how did the britishers suppress them the britishers crushed the revolt as they always did the british sent the troops and they targeted each and every villagers whoever is involved in the fight against the british officials even the adivasis tried to negotiate and solve the problem by talking but they surrounded them and they killed them mercilessly the british troops marched into the villages flogging and punishing who ever participated in this rebellion movement pulled them out of their houses and tortured them like anything so that the others would not dare next time to do looking at these incidents the villagers ran away from the villages into the jungles and to the forest however our leader of this movement gunda dur from the village could not be caught by the britishers he managed to escape from there and they gave a chance for the people that yes we can fight against the britishers this instilled the confidence among the people that you can fight against the britishers the victory of the bastar rebellion was that that the britishers decided to reduce the reservations to half of its calculations from the 1910 the calculation levels of the forest has been reduced to half of them so this gave a major victory for the bastar rebellion the bastar rebellion did not end up here even after india got its independence in 1970s the world bank has set an idea that 4600 hectares of natural sal forest has to be replaced by tropical pine pulp for the paper industry it was only after the local environmentalists made a huge cry that this is against the interest of the society and this kind of replacements will get environmental degradation then only the project was given up so always there were been efforts and tries made to keep the people away from the villages but the people always resisted that now we will move to another parts of asia where in indonesia what happened at the same time there the forest transformation in java the present day java is a rice producing islands of indonesia indonesia is a combination of large group of islands it is estimated nearly 1300 island group is together known as indonesian island group now moving on further today we have java producing as a rice producing island but earlier it was covered with thick forest indonesia was once a colony of the dutch people for nearly 400 years same like how india has been colonized by the britishers dutch has colonized indonesia and similar methods were followed in both the parts so dutch people started to do forest management in java because how the britishers need timber to build their ships in the similar way they also need timber to build the ships and to do exports and imports in 1600 the population of java is 3.4 million now moving on further a special tribal people used to live in java known as kalangs these people are the skilled forest cutters they cut the forest very skillfully skilled meaning here is they are very much talented and experienced and expertise in cutting down the forest trees so in 1755 they were once part of the mataram kingdom in which 6000 families used to stay when the kingdom got split they divided the population equally 300 3000 pop, uh, families on one side the three other 3000 families on the other side so the britishers how they want to control the foresters similarly the dutch also tried in indonesia to slowly gain control over the forest regions and control the forest tribal communities so these skilled people kalangs resisted the dutch move it is in 1770 the kalangs attacked the dutch fort johanna and this was also 
crushed by the Dutch people as the Britishers crushed the rebellions in India in a similar way the Dutch also crushed the rebellion in Dutch uh, sorry the Dutch also crushed the rebellion in Java so now let us find out the details now moving on into the details of Dutch scientific forestry the Dutch in the similar way how India was forced to follow the British rules and regulations in the similar way Dutch also imposed certain restrictions by forest laws in Java of Indonesia the 19th century the forest laws were brought into place they also want to restrict the entry of the villagers the villagers were restricted in entering into the forests because they want to preserve the forest wealth for their own needs and the river boats and they have given some exemptions for the villagers under supervision they can cut the trees they can use the wood for making river boats or to build houses and it is only in some specific forest lands under surveillance and supervision only but they used to punish the people whoever used to take their cattle horses or anything for grazing in the forest lands they used to give severe punishments for them and they used similarly as in india we need the forest timber for ship building and railways in the similar way dutch also need for the same reason ship building and railways networks improvement so they brought forest services into existence they installed the forest services in java first in 1882 alone 2 lakh 80000 slippers were cut alone from java which shows that how much amount of timber requirement is there for the dutch people and how much they are reliable on java and first they thought that they would give some taxes on the rent and the cultivation process of the forest laws but they need the support of the people to cut the forest trees and we have skilled people staying here who cut the forest very talentedly so they want them they want their support so they exempted some of the families who extended their support in labor and free labor for cutting the trees timber and also buffaloes to carry the loads out of the forest to the interior port areas so that they can export it very easily this process of exempting first laying the tax and later exempting for those who extended their free labor and buffaloes as a support for them is known as blandong dienstein system blandong dienstein system this system is followed in dutch so what happened next now salmon's challenge in 1890 suranthiko salmon who used to live in randubalatang village randubalatang village it was actually a teak forest village so in this teak forest village he started to question the authority of the dutch people on ownership he stated that wind water earth and wood these all are the natural properties which are natural rights of the people those who stay here how come a foreigner is coming and dictating the rules for the local people to follow in propagating this view his own son in law also participated very actively and spread this to many families nearly 3000 families supported his view and he challenged the dutch people when the dutch people came to survey the forest lands the 3000 family members had laid down and protested and stopped the dutch people entering into the forest like this salmon gave a threat to the dutch people's authority he questioned the right of ownership of the dutch people on the forest though only 3000 families supported him there are some more families who did not support him those people agreed to pay fines or taxes like this he also made a small momentum a rebellion against the dutch people's authority in java now the war and deforestation the wars had a major impact the world war 1 and the world war 2 had a major impact on deforestation now moving on to the situation in india and java the working plants were abandoned in india the forest department would cut the trees as per the requirement of the britishers and then they would be supplied for them there were no working plants at that point of time in india 
but when it comes to the dutch people the dutch people followed the policy of scorched earth policy this scorched earth policy is nothing but burning the huge and giant teak piles logs recklessly because they don't want these to be handed over to the japanese people then the japanese people started to attack the forest recklessly and forced the villagers to cut down the forest and use for their own war time requirements at this point of time the local villages are actually against the dutch in controlling the forest so they extended their support to japanese people in cutting down the forest and started to extend their land of cultivation into the forest land like that they started to occupy these lands under the influence of the japanese people when japan want to cut it for their own requirements the local villages also supported it and occupied that land to do the cultivation later after the war it has become very difficult for the indonesian forest services to recover these lands from the local people as it happened in india also the britishers forced the people to stay out of the forest lands but villages entered into the forest land occupied them and entered into conflict with the britishers so in this way wars also contributed for deforestation in india and indonesia now the new developments in forestry after 1980s the governments across in asia and africa are closely observing the scientific forestry when we look at the past experiences whenever the villages are put away from the forests that resulted in rebellion against the existing government and they have not supported the governments at all so the in india from mizoram to kerala they the local tribal people only have saved the forest as sacred groves known as saranas devarkuda kan rai etc and moving on further the villagers are the local villages do the patrolling far better and much much higher in quality when compared in protecting the forest because they worship the forest and they protect it when compared to the duty minded people of forest guards who do it as its duty and responsibility for them they don't take it as it to their heart they guard it and they leave it but the villagers take it as a sacred activity and perform it very well because it has been doing it for many hundreds of years like that now the local forest people the villagers the environmentalists all are thinking at different forms of forest management that is to involve the local people in managing or in looking after or taking care of the forest rather than getting somebody the security guards or the officials or the forest guards to guard them and keep the villagers away from the forest doesn't fetch any good results this was the experiences which we learned from the entire units discussion like whatever it happened in bastar in chatisgarh or in uh, samins challenge in uh, kalangs eu or in java the dutch could not control the villagers so it has forced itself to burn the teak in order to save from japanese people destroying the forest but japanese were successful because the local people supported the japanese in cutting down the forest like this the local people when they are not involved that resulted in a disaster of controlling the forest so now they are thinking on the new lines that compulsory the local people have to be given certain rights and at the same time they have to be involved in protection of the forest that's all we have in this lesson